Hey, it's John, and it's time for the J Mart cast for Monday, April 18th. What's going on? How are you, friends and family? Thank you for joining me yet again. Hope you've had a good week. My week has been all right. Not a lot's really happened. I've spent a lot of time with the kids this week because my wife's been working a lot. I did get a chance to go in for one day of jujitsu this week, so that was good. And it was actually, I was the only student that uh, was there that class in, so it was almost like basically a one-on-one session, which was very nice of him. He, The professor doesn't have to do that if it's just one student, but he's very nice and gracious with his time, so I got to basically have a personal training session. But... It's strange, actually, if you think about it. Like, you think it's great just having the professor's attention all to yourself for the whole class, but it's actually better when there's more people because obviously you get to practice more with different bodies and, you know, do the drill over and over again in a way that um, you can kind of ingrain it into your subconscious more so, as opposed to if you have the whole time with the professor, he's kind of like, he feels like he has to talk and say new things. Uh, a little bit too much and it's hard to like absorb everything and uh, yeah it's almost like too much uh, all at once rather than having little bits that can be drilled over and over again and ingrained so anyway still a good class but uh, not much else happened this week oh yeah on Friday I did release a new video on YouTube which was my first vlog video of my experiences at the Bitcoin conference in Miami. So if you haven't seen that thing, check it out, please. Uh, It's a pretty nice video, I would say, like one of the better videos I've ever made. Um, You know, my editing skills and uh, just confidence with the camera has gotten a lot better since I started this whole thing. So I'm happy with how it came out. Of course, just still looking to improve little by little, but... Yeah, if you haven't checked it out, please do so. If you have, hope you gave it a like, you commented. And I got a lot of weird, like, uh, scam crypto comments <laughs> under that video. Uh, I'm going to have to go through and see if I can, like, what should I, what, I sh- what should I do with them? Should I delete them or just, like, comment below and be like, get out of my comment section, scammers. <laughs> guess it's inevitable if you're like doing a Bitcoin video and there's going to be scammers commenting under it. Anyways, <clears throat> so that's been out there since Friday. And then um, I guess uh, I guess it was Easter. So happy Easter, everybody. I uh, hope you had like delicious dinners, spent time with family and got to do, you know, those nice uh, holiday things. I definitely got to do that. Spend time with with both my wife's family, my family as well. And my son got to do his first Easter egg hunt. And he seemed to like it a lot. It's fun watching him, like, go searching for for eggs. (laughs) Uh, It's kind of a weird concept, but uh, (laughs) he kind of got onto it pretty quickly and started looking around and picking up and collecting all the all the eggs he was pretty excited and then he was pretty good afterwards as well where he didn't like get into the chocolates right away but like waited to have dinner first so or I think I guess it was lunch because we uh, had to spend uh, time with family earlier in the day because my wife was working in the evenings but so that was pretty much my week not too much exciting stuff happened but sometimes you know Less excitement is is better too, you know. Sometimes you know they say uh, no news is good news. It's kind of like that. You don't necessarily always want to have excitement going on. The previous week I had all the excitement right of going to Miami and coming back, and so it's good to have just a more of a relaxed, laid back, less excitement kind of week. Well, speaking of excitement and something that's always uh, potentially exciting to talk about, of course, is. Uh, you know, this whole, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, thing we've been in for the last two years, right? This pandemic and COVID and vaccines, right? These are dangerous things to talk about. But, you know, sometimes it's good to talk about those dangerous things. (laughs) 
I've had a boring week, so let's talk about some dangerous things and get some excitement into the week. Who knows, maybe we'll even get censored for talking about this. But uh, one thing I'll say about COVID and the whole vaccine situation is I am so glad my kids are very, very young and not at the age where they have to make a decision or anything about like having them vaccinated against COVID. Like, thank God for that. Because, I mean, I already talked about it before, but like there was that case in the 12 to 15 children's trial of this girl named Bounty DeGary who was in the vaccine arm of the trial and has had like horrible injuries happen to her that like are life altering. And so that was in the 12 to 15 range group. Of course, my kids aren't that old, but anyways, I will, this is the topic I want to talk about is vaccinating children. You know what? This is, I, this is an interesting story, story I kind of wanted to share, I guess, now today. I'm on this thread. I want to talk about this is a while back, just as the pandemic, just before the pandemic, one of my neighbors from down the street was a client of mine who was training with me. And this was a gentleman who had certain uh, injuries, but wanted to basically do a rehab style training where he could get himself in the best shape possible to uh, potentially do a surgery on his shoulder because he had a, I think a, one of the rotator cuff tendons was almost completely, it might've been just completely actually ripped off. I think it might've been the supraspinatus. Can't remember exactly, but he had initially very little range of motion in the shoulder, but working with me, he like increased his range like quite significantly. His shoulder got a lot stronger. He was playing volleyball. He was able to, you know, volley and spike and bump and everything. So he was really good. He was doing well. He was happy with the service that he was getting. And then COVID happened. And so, of course, you know, everything turned to uh, online training. And so he was one of the people that continued to online train with me for a long time, which was great. And, you know, with the online training, you can't do as much to progress, but you can do a good job maintaining the progress you've made. And that's what we were doing. And that was going really well. And then, of course, a year later, finally, vaccines were available. And so this dude finally got his vaccine. And then he was like, I'm ready to get training in person again. And when I told him that I hadn't got mine yet and I was going to wait a little bit before I did, he was like really shocked by this <laughs> and basically decided that he was not going to train in person with me. In fairness to him, we did afterwards have like a long conversation and we came to kind of like a common understanding that we, you know, both were pro generally pro vaccine. It's just like what section of the population should receive it. Like originally, I thought that when the vaccine rollout for COVID was going to happen, it was going to be similar to how we do it for the flu, where like you get the most vulnerable people are the ones who are given the vaccine and everybody else has kind of like a choice to do it. And, you know, it's, it's not a big deal if you don't choose to. I totally miscalculated that, obviously. <laughs> like in, but... <laughs> Well, we both agreed that like there's certain populations that should get it. And then I just, I guess we disagreed on which populations shouldn't. But my, one of my populations that was a definite no was like children should not be getting these vaccines because they're so novel. We don't know what effect it could have on them. And they don't seem to be really affected in a way where they really get ill from COVID anyway. So there's no point. It's just like experimenting for no reason. And so now... I came across this thread on Twitter regarding this topic. So I'll just read it out and give my commentary as per usual. So here we go. This is from Jonathan Weissman. His Twitter account is at all the risks. And his, this thread starts with these COVID-19 vaccines threaten children's vital innate immune system when deployed in pandemic conditions at an age when their innate immune system is still under training. All right, so maybe I should try to unpack that a little bit there. So the innate immune system 
is part of the immune system that's just like built in and it reacts kind of generally to a whole bunch of things outside of the body and it's not very specific that's why it's the innate immune system and then the adaptive immune system is the specific one that adapts to exactly the specific thing that is you know in attacking the body at that time of infection and so the innate immune system is this system that you know of course in in children is still uh developing and of course development is a very in an important stage if you know <laughs> something wrong happens it has huge downstream consequences right so we don't want to mess with it <laughs> anyway so the thread continues their immature innate antibodies need a chance to train through pathogen exposure yeah so this is kind of I, is this part yeah i think maybe this is part of germ theory right that people have been proposing that kind of to combat some of the uh, sterile nature of like keeping things keeping kids clean in like the recent past uh, and like causing people to have uh, allergies maybe the right approach is actually to train people's uh, immune system by having controlled exposure to pathogens so yeah let me read this whole tweet one more time from the start and then hopefully with what i've was commenting it'll make better sense so it says these covid19 vaccines threaten children's vital innate immune system when deployed in pandemic conditions at an age when their innate immune system is still under training their immature innate antibodies need a chance to train through pathogen exposure okay next it goes on to say the innate igm antibody so that's part of the innate immune system, the IgM antibody. And here are some of the functions that it, that it, it says uh, that, that it provides, according to this uh, person. It guards against inflammation and autoimmune disease by recognizing self-antigens. It promotes homeostasis. So homeostasis is that kind of like a system in your body that keeps things optimal. And when things you know rise too much... It, it uh, say for body temperature temperature if the body temperature rises too much then things inside the body cool you down and vice versa if you uh, cool down too much your metabolism heats up to warm you up that's the homeostatic uh, system where things are op kept optimal and if it goes up or down the body reverses it the IgM antibody also suppresses allergic responses it efficiently destroys dying cells and they're polyreactive, they, where they bind to a broad range of antigens with low affinity. So that's a hallmark of innate immunity is because it doesn't bind anything specific. It has, it can bind a lot of things, but with fairly low affinity. And so that's always a trade-off. And with nature, you that's what you always have. You have, you have trade-offs. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can only have a certain aspect of something, but because of that, you have to give up something else. Anyways, in the next tweet, he says, Once bound to a virally infected cell, IgM antibodies can trigger the classical complement pathway via binding protein C1Q, an effector function known as complement-dependent cytotoxicity. So that's a mouthful there, but basically what it means is this IgM is able to bind uh, a virally infected cell and then it's able to bind a different antibody and then together that's able to signal a cell destruction program of the infected cell okay so then he says the lancet recognizes children have an inherent immune preparedness to novel pathogens including sars-cov-2 likely driven by their innate igm antibodies which contain the virus for up to two weeks of infectivity long enough to produce antigen specific antibodies if needed. So yeah, there you go. He's saying that like with children, because they have a lot of this IgM antibody, they can hold off the virus long enough to either beat it off completely or just have their adaptive immunity then kick in and beat off the rest of it. Then he says, as innate antibodies with high avidity, and this is a word that he then um, 
defines as overall binding strength. So with high overall binding strength, but low affinity. So low affinity means binding strength at a given binding site. So these Ig and M antibodies, they have low affinity because they don't actually have the ability to bind any specific site tightly, but they can bind a lot of different sites uh, just with low affinity. Uh, so overall with high avidity or overall high binding strength. So let me read the tweet from the start again. As innate antibodies with high avidity but low affinity, IgM can broadly cross-react to different antigens. That's kind of what I already said. They are broad, which is good, but they are susceptible to being outcompeted, which is a concern. Now with COVID vaccines, we know that they're leaky vaccines and they, they and that they cannot prevent transmission. So there's increasingly more infectious variants, and we've seen that with Omicron, of course, that propagate and dominate. And this is very similar to previous studies. Specifically, there's a Merrick's disease in poultry study that shows that this happens all the time. And so this highly infectious strain then guarantees re-exposure and re-boosting of the vaccine high affinity anti-spike protein antibodies, right? And so that's a problem because now what happens is that you have a competition between the non-neutralizing, highly specific anti-spike protein vaccine antibodies and the neutralizing non-specific innate immune system IgM antibody. Now, because of its higher affinity, the vaccine antibody might actually outcompete the neutralizing IgM antibody in such a way that it might coat the virus in a way that doesn't actually prevent cellular infection, but blocks the IgM antibody from being effective. And that's not good. <laughs> that would not be that would not be good at all, right? Instead, what we should do is we should try to train the IgM antibodies by exposure. The last uh, tweet in this uh, thread is, it is reckless to experiment untried vaccines on children with such naive innate antibodies. Substituting training up functional polyreactive IgM for non-neutralizing anti-spike va anti -spike vaccine antibodies at the cost of exposure to a systematically spread toxin, which is the spike protein, is unthinkable. I tend to agree with that. Like, it's kind of crazy. Like, it's been shown, like, in animal models that the spike protein is toxic and it can cross the blood-brain barrier. You know, it's just not a great thing to expose yourself to. And then, of course, originally it was said that the spike protein that your body was exposed to would stay in the region of the where the shot was administered. But we now know that's not true and it actually gets systemically spread. Right? It's part of why the heart gets affected. <laughs> All the people affected with myocarditis, right? Let's not forget about that. And anyway, oh, and actually, this guy's got a bunch of sources here, too. He's got at least one, two, three, four, four sources with PubMed links that you can open and read. Now, I'll be honest, I haven't actually read through uh, like these articles, but like my, you know, training of biology helps me like navigate through this and be able to make sense of this. Hopefully what I was able to talk about in this helped make sense of some of this stuff for you. If you have any further questions, you can always reach out. Of course, email me at newsletter at jmartfit.com or Reach out on social media at jmartfit on Instagram and Twitter. All right, real quick. I'm getting pretty tired. I kind of want to go to bed. So I'm going to try to finish this up real quick. I'm going to read off another thread that is Bitcoin related. This is by Lynn Alden, who is an awesome person to follow. So she says, for decades, oh yeah, her... her um, Twitter account is Lynn Alden Contact. It's L-Y-N-A-L-D-N Contact. 
For decades, people didn't have the capability to send significant amounts of money globally without using banks. Governments can easily regulate banks. Technology has now provided consumer-to-consumer -consumer global payments. It will be interesting to see how governments respond. And the technology is open source too. She's talking about Bitcoin. Basically, if governments want to prevent it, they now have to do so on the consumer layer rather than merely the banking layer. I think what she means is that it's because it's op it's just open source software, there's no like company you can go to and be like, hey, stop it. You can't make any more Bitcoin software. Like <laughs> it doesn't work like that. She says the number of enforcement points to do that is many orders of magnitude larger, the whole population. Yeah, basically you have to go person by person and be like, are you using Bitcoin? Okay, you can't do that then. <laughs> this is further complicated by the fact that other than stable coins, cryptocurrencies aren't directly linked to currency. So if you send Bitcoin to someone, you are just participating in an open source public ledger that officially isn't currency. It's just information speech yeah that's the amazing thing about bitcoin is like it's just like code right and it, it kind of falls under the free speech amendment for like in terms of like rights so that it's kind of like it's crazy this is this crazy thing where it's just an idea of free speech and this speech is able to transfer value it's an amazing amazing thing anyways then she says, Bitcoin and many cryptocurrencies are basically just a sophisticated way of people updating a big decentralized Google spreadsheet with each other. To prevent that from happening is challenging from a legal perspective outside of authoritarian regimes. Encryption and software have a legal precedent in several developed countries of being considered speech. Code is language. That obviously gets messier now that encryption and software can be used as a form of liquid bearer asset recognized money. Man, that is a mouthful. Liquid bearer asset recognized money. Liquid. Liquid means like you can sell it. You can buy it and sell it. That's what liquid means. Like a house is not very liquid because you can't buy it and sell it very easily. Cash is very liquid because you can use it for pretty much anything and you'll accept it for pretty much anything, right? That's what liquid means, bearer asset. So bearer means you hold it, you are the bearer of it. And asset means something that is of value, right? And then recognized money. Of course, what is money? That's the most important question. Money is a store of value, medium of exchange and a unit of, and a unit of account. It is... Um, rare, it is portable, divisible, durable, recognizable, fungible. You guys know what fungible means? It means like one's the same as every other one. So if one Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin, they all have the same value and there's no difference between them. Like one dollar is the same as the other, any other dollar bill. They're all the same. If you had 10 and you picked one up, it wouldn't matter which one you had. Anyways, next. Uh, so she says that obviously gets messy now that encryption and software can be used as a form of liquid bear asset recognized money. Turkey banned crypto for payments, but not for holding or investing last year. With a failing currency and 60% inflation, they basically said that you have to use that failing currency to transact rather than other forms of information. What Turkey did is harder to do in jurisdictions that have more division of government powers, various competing interests, constitutional protections on certain things, and so forth. It's also hard to enforce, including in Turkey. It's at the consumer layer, remember. You have to stop every single person using the U.S. banned gold ownership for decades. It was illegal to own a benign yellow metal. They couldn't really enforce it in practice, but they used big penalties, which were barely used. Can the U.S. ban the sharing of certain information? If governments want to stop consumer-to-consumer -consumer global exchange of liquid value, they now basically have to say it's illegal to exchange certain types of open-source information speech with someone outside 
of approved conditions. And that gets awkward. <laughs> yeah, mic drop right there. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's an amazing thing to think about. Like the only way you can stop people from using Bitcoin is basically stop every person who you catch. There's no way, to, there's no other way to stop it, but just constantly um, monitor and stop everyone who does it. But it's like he's like, like she said, it's hard to enforce. It's, it's, it's really, really hard to enforce. It's just speech. And with like the digital age, it's so easy to transmit speech. <laughs> Anyways, with that, I don't have the energy to continue another five minutes love you all for listening to the end thank you so much you, you all are the best appreciate you all you know who you are <laughs> and as always stay active be grateful jmart out